Thanks for joining the Focus Hunting Podcast. For us, hunting in the outdoors isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Join us as we cover all things hunting, fishing, and the outdoors in Western Canada. The light, yeah. Yeah. Because indoor for me, I it's not like a really big deal, but I noticed that my my peep shadow is it's very it's it's not it's not very pronounced so every time i'm shooting indoor i really got to focus on that so be more like if i'm shooting outside that's one thing i notice it's okay. it's pretty dark i noticed when i was shooting my bow last week um i don't know if it's because there's a light right above me um i tried turning it off too but it's just the way the light reflects down in the basement here i actually can't get a clear i, I can't focus on my peep I can kind of see the mm -hmm. ring of it, but it's very fuzzy. It's not like outside and it's like crisp. Yeah. So I basically put that in the center and literally all I'm thinking of is my release motion because it's, it's just fuzzy. I got to figure it out and play with some lighting and stuff, but yeah, I can't. Maybe I can't, it's those old man that. eyes you got. That's the well, there's, you know what? That is very, very possible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah so peep shadow peep shadow sucks though yeah because it does yeah. throw you off oh you it totally does that, yeah sure. yeah I, I there was uh that's why i shoot so much in low low light like i'll draw back and then i'll try and just shoot with my anchor and see how see how far i can take it because i in 2018 when I shot a ball just in that super thick timber, when it's like near last light, you know, 15 minutes before last light, you can't see anything. I, I drew back on a ball at 30 yards and I had to like pull my head completely out and then go back in. Cause I so much so that I couldn't see my peep and, and uh, make a shot. It's just kind of uncomfortable. Right. So I've been trying to get used to that and then to just going through the motions and, breaking down my form that's why i'm going to put that uh indoor kind of little mini shooting range in my garage like with a light yeah what well, kind yeah. of release do you shoot Derek? uh knock to it knock to it yeah the two finger yeah okay. yeah two finger thumb release it's like a carter wise guy yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah i've shot that for a long time i used to shoot a, a finger release and because yeah, like at the time strike. yeah i was shooting so much precision rifle that was like at the height of when I was shooting, I started messing with my, my mind, like shot process with my rifle shooting and just, cause, oh, really? you know, sighting in like 50, 60 guns, a, a summer, right. And it was starting to really mess with me that kind of mind. You wouldn't think it would, but it, it really was. So I like that in the thumb release. It's a little bit different, different uh, ergonomics of that. So switch that and my groups got way better. Yeah, yeah, with a cool. th with a thumb release, there's definitely less chance of you having any punching movements or any sudden jerking, mm -hmm. and that it's more of a smooth, natural process. It's similar to like a breakaway. Have you ever shot a breakaway release, like a back tension? I've shot a hinge before. Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't like at, for like improving style. I found it was pretty good. Like just the process of of pulling through. But I always know if I'm really rusty at the start, like I'll be punching a little bit early on um i'll notice it like like last time i went and shot i kind of start, was starting to notice it again because like my my fingers like and, and it's funny too because a lot of guys will think i'm punching because these fingers will move but they're mm -hmm. not doing anything they don't do anything so like if i'm sitting here i'll, I'll hold in and it's like this is the only my only two fingers that matter are these yeah. ones and then i'll just come in and and then pull through but I find that with my new Hoyt, it's a little bit harder for me to pull through shots because like with my Hoyt Defiant Turbo, that thing was 70 pound or yeah, no, 70, 74 pounds with 70% let off. So yeah. the holding weight, it's like almost 20, it's like 20 pounds. Hey, yeah. So that was like very mm -hmm. like secure. Like when you feel it, like you are pulling through that shot. There is yeah. no choice because you're already holding 20 pounds, right? So you're holding heavy at the back. Yeah. Wall. Yeah. yeah. So with like when these, like with my new bow, I really have to get that in my mind. I might start shooting my defiant at the start of the year just to like get ingrained in my mind that I'm holding weight and holding back and then pulling through is a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Um, and then switch over, but, uh, just working through those, 
what uh messed off what's so you're, you're shooting what the rx7 now or the rx8 yeah rx7 rx7 what are the yeah. cams like on that old defiant you have compared to the new ones night and day like the the defiant was so much more aggressive to the point can that... you can sorry dude can you grab those and show me are they right there beside you uh both? yeah just give me a second I'll yeah for them. sure i'm gonna put you up on the the big screen here i want to see those things yeah cam design too has a big deal to do with um your back wall and your back wall it like if you have a soft back wall or a heavy back wall that's going to have an uh impact on just like your ability to pull through that shot do you know what i mean that's why like if yeah. you look at like target target bows they have smaller they got smaller cams compared to like like that pse omen those s2 cams on that pse omen yeah man those things once you get to like the let off on that bow man is it's like it's at 80 but it's not 80 percent just because of the cam design because there's they're the shape of them once you get through the valley and then like you go over the wall over the hump yeah into the back wall it's like you just basically pull 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 and then you like uh, fall into it and it's like once you're into it it's like super easy right you could sit there yeah. full draw forever but the problem is when it's there's no tension here it's easy a lot easier to have some sort of punching motion do you know what i mean yeah rather than just if there's constant weight on it and that's like when we talked to um when we talked to keelan there uh, on inside out precision he talked about tying the knot and like how i reference it is like with my kids and people i'm teaching i'm like that action you see of of the shot breaking you know when it just goes like this and it falls you know the front arm falls down the back arm falls down yeah that's a that that's not like that's involuntary that happens so like imagine imagine taking a rope pulling hard on with grabbing with each hand and just like trying to pull it apart and then i come in with scissors and cut it your hands is going to go like this right and that's the same essentially the same that's what's happening with a bow is like you're shooting and you have tension and all of a sudden the shot breaks and everything just falls right yeah so that one oh yeah i see yeah look at that yeah so that's your defiant yeah, yeah that's, that's my that's defiant, defiant. Yeah. And then here's the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, quite a bit different. Yeah, and you see, okay, do you just see how the shape is of those cams? Is that's what we're talking about? Is like, soon as those things, soon as you get through the valley with those cams and those cams roll over, it's gonna fall softly. It's gonna fall into the back wall, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 You can tell big difference on them, size too, which which makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, I got to say mine's just for me anyway. The cams on my Ventum it's it's just a nice rollover and there's enough tension in the back there that it doesn't feel like I'm struggling like it wants to let go. It's like it's all you. But yeah. that's that's for me. It it fits me that way. Well, and I, that's what that's why I don't like the so like last year I was shooting two I had the um omen and the fortis and the fortis had the ec2 cams on them and those are basically like a hybrid between their s2 and their e2 and their e2 were great for at when you were at like for a hunting situation if you're at full draw and you have to sit there and hold for a long time they're great because they, the the shape of the cam once it rolled over it had very there was very little pull required to hold at full draw but the problem is like i was saying if there's not a lot of tension here it's a lot harder for that shot to naturally just like break and fall away rather than you just like punch it yeah. or have a reaction to do it. Whereas like those E2 cams, they're more smooth. It's harder to pull back. It's harder to get through to the back wall and it's stiffer at the back wall. But the thing is the shot falls into place a lot naturally because there's more tension at the back wall. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, I'm shooting, uh, I got those, Athens bows so I'm going to set those up those are pretty they look pretty good I haven't done it yet I'm, I'm intrigued to see how nicely they tune I really am well they have one of them has the AccuTune system 
So you don't have to take the axle, you don't have to take the cams off to shim them at all. You can just, yeah, I like that. Uh, just, especially I think if eventually you just don't all, have a, every bow will have that. I sure hope so for the average person who doesn't have access to a shop. Um, well, just how quick it is. Like, yeah, it's to even when you take it to a shop to do it, you have to be there. Like, if you're paper tuning your bow and you got some, if you can't tune your bow. And you're having to move your rest. Like I'm like we talked about before, I'm I'm not I'm against moving your rest if you know if all possible, but it takes a long time, man. Like you gotta pull that axle out. I mean, all, some of these bows now have the little clips, like PSC came out with those little clips, and um, but I mean, like still those clips, they can just pull out, they fall out. Um, yeah. Well, I think you gotta be there anyway to get a proper tune because having somebody else shoot your bow and just kind of, you know, just to give it a couple test shots and make up, yeah, it's good. Be like, yeah. If you're not holding it, if you're not shooting it, you know, maybe if, even if the mechanics are tuned in, maybe it'll show something else for you that's on you that you need to work on. And that's the important thing. Those bow shop guys, hopefully you have a good one. We'll yeah, pick up on that and help you out and put you in the right direction. Yeah, especially if you got a lot of hand torque, right? Yeah, that'll screw everything up. Doesn't yeah. matter how mechanically perfect your bow is. It's, yeah. But, that's what's yeah. kind of appealing about those bow techs. I, I keep looking at those just because even like even if you don't have a, a press, that's besides the fact, but you could you could deal with a lot of stuff in the field, right? I'll go grab that bow. You guys keep chatting here. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's one thing I was chatting with a couple of guys about because like I have access to a press, but I don't have a press in my house. So and then to go to a pro shop, and usually I do if something's really out of whack, like yeah. something really major. Yeah, I just honestly coming from the this technical, that's what I do is like I, I do know there's skill difference between people. And it's like I want someone that's professionally looking at yes. some of this stuff, right? They see it all the time, right? That's right. And they know everything about them, or you know, they're gonna be like, Yeah, hmm, I'm pretty sure the bow is there. Let's look at your form or vice versa. Well, okay, we'll stick to the bow your form's actually really good yeah I'm figuring that out yeah no i i hear you there and same thing i'm sure i could i know i've got a couple buddies that have presses um but then again you got to be able to figure out what you got the tools that you need and it's all doable but if you were able to go well into your garage or whatever you know something slightly out set up your paper tuner mm -hmm. and be able yeah, to do especially, it yourself yeah especially paper tuning that's one thing that I did, I did have one year where like, it's funny, like people will talk about aero flight and if your bow's out of tune, like the effects of that, but that's in like calm weather. If you're yeah. dealing with high winds, I took a shot on a mule deer and it was high wind. And because my bow, I was just trashing my bow. Uh, my aero flight was all weird and my arrow. I was at 30 yards and I went to shoot and I shot and had a steep crosswind. And just because my arrow flight was so wonky, it just went like this and it went sideways and then straight. And it's, really? it's just like, as soon as you see that, you're like, oh my God, that's because my arrow flight is all weird. And then the wind is able to push it around a lot easier. Like it just stuff isn't working right, right? And then you yeah. start seeing that downrange. Yeah. And I, th I think a lot of things too is one, don't just hop on YouTube and start making adjustments and stuff. YouTube can be a great tool, but at the same time, just because you're watching YouTube doesn't mean the person on there is necessarily the best educated in it. Yeah. Go learn from somebody, get lots of information off it. It's good to understand what, what cause and effect mm -hmm. on, on, on your mechanics. But I encourage lots of people to, you know, be able to work on their own bows but get some professional advice from, and hopefully some of these guys aren't too busy when you go in, ask questions and, you know, let, I know my guy in particular, you know, if I were to ask him questions and breaking it down and he would answer them, he wouldn't let me leave without knowing he's good like that. And then I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by other people who are, you know, great with, with the mechanics and all that kind of stuff. So I'm lucky in that situation, but uh, I, I encourage other people to, you know, ask questions, but ask actual people that you know, know their stuff and learn from them. It's just yeah. mechanics. Every, every machine, every bow, everything can be taken apart and it's scary at first, but it's not, not when you know how to put it back together. Just don't have extra screws and shit afterwards. That's not a good thing. Yeah. 
It's not. Yeah, it, sh- it shouldn't be like your truck or something. You're ch- <laughs> Whenever you're changing something, yeah. Where did this like, bolt huh. come from? I didn't need that bolt, right? Did they yeah. give me it? Did I they give so. me an extra bolt, or did I? What the? I've always wanted to walk by a mechanic and go to his little bolt tray, the magnetic ones where they keep all the important <laughs> things, and throw a couple extra just random <laughs> bolts in there. <laughs> See if they yeah. can figure this one out. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So this is that bow. I'll uh, I'll put it on the big screen here. Uh, so if you guys are listening, you have to go to YouTube, which I recommend you guys go to YouTube anyway and watch these because um, there we go. Okay, so I'll hold it up to the camera here. So you can see right here, this mm-hmm. is the AccuTune system. Hopefully the camera zooms into that, not to my face. Okay, so what you do is you just put an Allen key in there. And then, oh no, sorry. First of all, where's that hole? A couple couple locking screws or something. Uh, Talk about old man eyes, eh? Look at, I got to hold this fucking thing away from me. Okay, right right here. Underneath, there's a little, you got to put an Allen key in there and you loosen this little set screw. And then you take another Allen key and you put it in here and you move it clockwise or counterclockwise, and that will shim your cam left or right. Now, one of the cool things about this system compared to that Bowtech system is, look how small that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that's tiny. Like, look at that. It's actually like, look at the. You can see on the on the on the limbs, eh? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, look how small that is. The Bowtech one, I've worked on those. They're it's really good. Same principle, but it's really bulky on both sides. So. Um, That's pretty awesome. Yeah, so you can see the one on the bottom as well. Um, but yeah, I'm super cool to try that. But like, just in terms of like, um, working on your own bow for any uh, paper tuning, it's awesome because then you're not relying on having to shift your sight a long ways. And I think guys do that just as an alternative to get away from the shops because a lot of the time you take your sh- your bow to the shop. Unless you have a really good relationship with your archery shop, you know, you're going to have to drop it off and then they'll say, okay, we'll call you when it's ready. But like you were saying, Pete, it's really good to be there during that process of them doing all this stuff. Number one, so you learn how a bow works, the mechanics of a bow. And number two, you can actually be there because you're the one who's going to be shooting it. Yeah. And That's a lot why of it's good to support time, your... Right? Yeah, for sure. And that's why it's like, good to support your pro shops. Yeah. And a lot of like for me to go to a good bow shop, that's two and a half hour drive one way. Yeah. That's like a major ordeal. So if I'm picking up a bow, it's good to it's good to do those checks too, right? Like you got to put those reps in. Like I remember uh anytime I would get a string, string and third axis tuned up on my bow before I started kind of doing my, more of my own thing man, I'd really have to mentally prepare myself. I'd get my reps up to 200 reps in a two, two, 300 reps in a day. Cause I would have to set aside enough time to make sure I shoot that string that they put on enough that if I have some peep twist that I'm there, cause I didn't want to deal with it on like in the local shops were all closing down over COVID. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's good to be able to be self-sufficient, do that on your own and do your own paper, especially paper tuning. You should be doing that periodically anyway. Yeah. There's a one bonus about this reno downstairs here this year is that I didn't have anywhere, literally didn't have anywhere to properly paper tune. Doing it outside is not really, it's not. No, it's, you any can't really paper breeze. tune outside. Yeah. So now that I've got the indoor thing this winter, I'm going to build a, a stand that you can put like a roll of paper on and, you know, just a nice little proper setup and be able to check it. Like you say, Derek, just periodically and make sure nothing's out of whack, especially before, yeah. I don't know, a big a big shoot or, uh, you know, or a hunt or something like that, where it's like, no, let's just make sure before I leave this house. Yeah. And check in your third axis. I missed on a big gear because of that. I was kind of choked actually. Um, just heart wrenching, right? Like you go and you start shooting steep. If you, if you never check down at like a 3d tournament or like attack event, um, or even just like somewhere that, you know, you can shoot at like a, 45 or beyond you start knowing your limitations really quickly because 
in the moment, that's not when you want to find out what your limitations are. Like 50 yards is probably your max. I'd say you should be shooting at those distances just because your shoot to your actual like line of sight shoot to range is can be like 70, 80 yards. Hey, and that drag, I, I think I missed because and I was talking with, uh, I think it's the uh, archery precision does a lot of drag models. And I think it was like, a combination of drag and parachuting off my veins and that gets exaggerated and combined with third axis problems so if you're shooting like steep 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 down range like 50 60 yards you'll see that your range finding binoculars a range finder you range it and um, it's taking into account the gravitational pull and i just know that because when I've shot long range stuff, there is that drag coefficient that you have to be conscious of. You can't just put in a shoot to range. That'll work to a degree, but 600 and beyond, you have to put in different models. Hey, eh? and that's the same. I was, I'm like, Oh, that's the exact same with an arrow. Then you're going to have additional drag from your veins or your broadhead configuration. And you'll see that exaggerated because your flight time is increased at the back end of the arrow. So that's why you have to be, conscious of that if you're taking those shots that you've kind of probably practiced and tracked that hey derek does <clears throat> speed have any impact on gravitational pull so like uh, when you're long range shooting if you're shooting a bullet that's really fast let's just say faster than another bullet but you're shooting at the same distance does the speed have anything to do on the gravitational pull of that bullet uh, yeah, time, time of flight, but, but here's the thing. So the, when you increase the grain, like as, so at bullets, there's only one thing you can do, right? They get longer. That's yeah. the only thing. So it's, it's a balancing act between center of pressure and center of balance. So center of pressure is at the front end of the bullet and center of pressure is at the body of the bullet. So you'll have the datum line, which is like, that's where the, the front end of the shoulder so like if you have say like this pen, you got, a, you got your center of pressure at the front end and your center of balance is here. If you increase the center of balance to farther back by increasing its actual physical size would be grains, mm -hmm. it's going to be more stable. So in that stability at, at the long, long range, when you get to transonic range, and that would be like, you're going from supersonic transitioning into like 1100 feet per second or below it starts to lose the sonic boom that stabilizes it because a lot of people don't know that um it yaws hey the bolt kind of actually is sitting and it this is an exaggeration of what it's doing as it's spinning okay. it's very tight but when it's yawing that provides itself the stability and the sonic boom behind it helps stable it further so you know what I'm trying to say is that there's an optimized setup. So like a great example would be like a 338 Lapua Magnum. Everybody's shooting the 300s because the BC is so good, but speed kills, speed hits targets. So, what right? you, okay, so can you just is better. Yeah, do you, can you back up a sec? BC, what does that mean? Uh, bolt coefficient. So okay. that, that'd be the, the studies that have been done on the basically aero, aerodynamic drag of a projectile. There's different models. One's like with a flat back, uh, a flat back of the bullet. And then that's a G1. And the G7 is the studies they did with a boat tail where it's like, it's kind of angled, then goes flat. And that oh, boat okay. tail is more, it's more aerodynamic. There's less turbulence behind it, but those okay. flat flat uh bottom bullets will stabilize faster so they'll be more accurate in certain circumstances but so essentially so line of sight shooting speed obviously is always going to be better um but again there's that diminishing returns is if it's not optimized so if you went like it depends on the type of shooting you're doing because if you did the the ballistics i would say go to like your maximum range and run the ballistics on your drop and then see see what the difference is between the two bullets because those smaller projectiles uh they're affected by the wind drastically like to the point that the smaller have... ones are yeah yeah oh, okay i would have thought a bigger one would have be just because of it's got more surf like 
surface area. So right. If it's the same for... caliber, like bigger means oh. it's going to be longer, right? So then it's going to yeah. kick the wind a little bit better because that's, that's what it. that effect is, right? So because what happens is that center of balance is always trying to push to like make it go over center. So then that's, that's going to that's going to affect things. And then too, just like your speed, um, if you're getting beyond 3,100 feet, you're getting into the hyper performance stuff and that's a barrel burner. I always am looking at that like anytime like this new cartridge comes out and it's 3,150 or whatever or 31 above, I'm like, ooh. That's, I, I that's have, uh, I've got a 65300 um, and it shoots over 3,000 feet per second. I can't remember oh, exactly yeah. what it shoots. But that thing, yeah, that's like, yeah. I haven't shot that gun in a long, long time. But I remember when you take it to the range, you shoot around through it. And like the barrel was freaking warm. You shoot yeah. two and it's hot. Yeah, and that's a lot of over overboard that does that. And that's too, you got to be cautious with the 7 mm's for that too. Like, um, used to set up a lot of guns, uh, 28 nozzlers. Because that was like a hot thing coming out of the, uh, like nozzler did nozzler, 28, 30, um, right. 30 i believe but the 28s everybody want them because they're just a wind kicking machine like they just and and like they, they kick the wind you to put things in perspective like and this is with like a six millimeter creed more and like a 308 you have to be twice as good at calling wind with the 308 what do you twice mean calling wind calling wind like so say if you're trying to hit a target like say 800 yards fuck that's a long way man that's a long <laughs> yeah. poke my kids have shot, uh, I think Cohen and Mace both shot 12, 1238 was the farthest. I, With what 2000. caliber? Uh, 6.5284. Yeah. 6.5284. You could like, what, yeah. you got to break like that a, down for me. It, yeah, it's like a, it's, it, I think it's more common now, but it's kind of like a little bit of a wildcat. It's like oh, a yeah, okay. M cartridge neck down to a 6.5. Oh, okay. Um, essentially so, yeah. but there's like a it's a european cartridge oh okay kind of that's thing. probably why i never heard of it you shoot moose with it though you guys oh, really? yeah i know lots of guys i mean sh they shoot moose with that type of stuff which is to me is crazy i would probably favor something like a 338 but um but yeah the my kids, brother they shoots a 338 it. yeah so okay now go back to like when so like when calibrating now obviously you have something to calibrate through and you're not just like sticking your finger in your mouth and be like okay we're going like that yeah no 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 <laughs> No, you use like a Kestrel, like I was saying, uh, like on the gear gear loadout review. I don't know if I can see it here. Yeah, we I remember we've yeah. seen it in uh, on episode 153. You had one. So yeah, here. yeah. So Kestrel, that's like an intermediate. Like you shouldn't be relying on that. But um, basically what you can do is uh, you take your spotter. Normally you would probably want to have a two-man team. So you have someone over your right-hand shoulder. And what they do is they zoom into the halfway point, a feature out of the landscape, and then they they focus in on that uh, whatever landmark is at halfway. And then you you have that focus, you leave that focus, and then you plane up to your target, and then you observe the mirage. And you'll yeah, see. Yeah, freaking. It, now, is it is it true with this mirage? Because this is I was looking into this when I was looking at spotting scopes. You can sort. You can judge how far or how fast the wind is downrange by yeah. how is it how high the mirage is or how does it de it depends so it's so and it's funny because they're even in like winter there's always mirage sun's out there's going to be mirage um i would rather a it's actually easier to shoot in well this might be again controversial i have found that it's a little bit easier to shoot in a more steady wind that's a little bit higher um, just because you can call the wind. So what you'll get, you'll get this, this mirage effect of essentially if, if you're, so let me explain it like this. So you have like mirage is straight up. Well, that's obviously a no wind call. And then mirage is like this. And then mirage is like this. Like, you know, when you get to like this, like your, your 15, 10, 15 mile an hour call would be like, you'll see it. You'll see lines going like this and you'll see it kind of, it's hard to explain. It's like wavy lines and it's bending the light and it's, um, it's a feature that you kind of have to get a, it's almost artistic, right? You get a feel no, for you're getting it. This, yeah. You're getting this through your spotter when yeah, you're looking at your spotter. You're getting, yeah. Right. Because you're looking at such far distance. Mm -hmm. Now, is there optics that will uh, limit that? Like if you get really good optics, will it 
limit those mirages? Like, is there a difference between looking at something in that far away with really good optics, like a Swaro compared to like a, just a... Yeah, vortex? you'll be able to see it better or it'll cut through better. So the thing is, though, and this is why um, people... So there's different types of glass quality. And that's why I really say, like, if anyone were to go above 30 power and that's where you want to be living you have to watch out for aberrations so that's where you want like apple chromatic lenses color adjusted lenses where the prism the focal length point is all the colors are correct and the really cheap stuff that's why you're getting blurry is because the lens quality there's aberrations in between your eyeball and that farthest outside objective lens so then you'll see where you try and crank the power up and it gets super blurry. That just means that the lenses potentially can't hold up to that. And that's why Swaro with zero aberrations, crystal clear. What you'll be able to do is you'll be able to see that mirage super clearly. Like um, when I'm shooting real long range. So like I'll have like my buddy Pat will be over my shoulder and he'll have a Swaro for sure. You have to like um, you can do it with, with, like some of the old razors, they had a fixed eyepiece at 30 power and they had a reticle in there. And uh, some of the Revic stuff too, they have, they have fixed power uh, eyepieces. And that's what, that's what you're doing with that. They're just saying, okay, 30 or 40 power, that's what you're limited to. And then all the, the uh, sub tension lines and measuring tools inside that reticle are all based off of that power range. And uh, you can like, I've shot out to pass a thousand with a 10 power. So you don't need much power to be pretty accurate. It's just target identification too, right? Like at that um, distance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like if you're zooming in and you're seeing a bunch of mirage, that can be helpful. But like That's I was a saying, long fucking way, man. Yeah. That's like a, mile, a kilometer yeah. away. Like, I remember once I was shooting at seventeen fifty, um, <sighs> two point <laughs> seven second flight time. <laughs> that was that's what i was like, gonna ask oh, you like yeah like that was like so flying. <laughs> yeah how okay. do you calculate yeah like what's the time for even a thousand yards like what's the time i guess it's not a lot still no it wouldn't but there is like at the far 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 shots um i think like 300 win you're pretty much limited your max effective range would be 15 to 1700 yards depending on the bullet and, what's and, the uh, furthest yeah. you've ever shot an animal First I've ever shot an animal I'll be I try to keep it fairly reserved. I think it would have been like around six hundred. Five fifty, six hundred. I don't like going right. too much farther than that. Okay. I, I I I'm confident I can make the hit at 800, 900, but I don't like like as soon as, soon as I started um uh, like especially with like like I shot I shot an elk once at five fifty and uh I shot him twice. I shot him on the run even. He ran and I I shot him when he was standing and uh, he kind of bucked it, like buckled and then started to run. And I hit him again in the heart at 550. So uh, wow. I, I don't like to push it. And, and Like you see the limits get pushed all the time. I just don't like, I mean, in certain circumstances, I mean, if you're really practiced, like, like the gun I shot it with, like it's on his fourth barrel. I remember the one, like I shoot a lot. Like if it's just like with your bow, does anybody have any business shooting at 65? If you're not practicing all the time, like it, it, you know, 78 yeah. yards, you get into that zone where it's like, it's kind of gets, if you're not a practice shot and you are like, I should preface this. I, I only take shots. I know we're a hundred, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah nothing, for sure. nothing will like a hundred percent kill shot. And I know the wind. Yeah, I can't figure yeah. it out the wind. I'm like, mm -mm. yeah, not gonna sure. do it. Yeah, and that's one thing people have to remember is shooting where they're comfortable. Like for me, shooting an I'm more comfortable at 60 yards than I am at 30 yards mm -hmm. shooting my bow. Yeah, well, it's because I also shoot. Practice. Well, and I shoot at 70. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, like I we'll mean, shoot targets out to a thousand. You know, mm -hmm. a thousand fifteen hundred, or if that's just interesting, cool. Like so, when we do. So I used to do a lot of work with uh, like best of the West uh, through open range optics. And we do like demos for customers and it basically it's to help them learn their system. And that's what they're selling. They're selling like shooting systems, platforms, right? So range finder, 
you know, you got your gun, your scope, it's all tuned up. We do the reloads, the trajectory validations, all of that. Um, and then you give it to the customer, you show them the ins and outs and shooting form, fundamentals of marksmanship, and um, all that translates to happy customer, right? They're shooting downrange, pretty far ranges. Um, but when we do the trajectory validation, we shoot at 600, so we'll sight them in. We'll shoot a group, and they were like little itty bitty little groups, quarter MLA groups, and then we'll at what uh, distance? At a hundred yards, yeah, okay. hundred yards, yeah. I yeah, was gonna say we'll... quarter MLA at a thousand. I was like, holy fuck, yeah, no shit. What's your so, so what? So what would 70... be like a good a good grouping at a thousand yards? Thousand yards. You could shoot if you could shoot and hold five inch groups gotcha. you're a good shooter wow. yeah yeah because yeah, I, you could it could be 10 inch groups like so at those distances that's more about your wind call right so like if and so that's how you would determine actually like like when i have a reloading protocol i go through it's not just about the group so i'll take the best groups and then i'll verse them on the chronograph secondarily so the first stage is okay i got groups and they're in an appropriate velocity range that I deem is acceptable for my application. I'll usually try and hang at the higher end of the spectrum. I know cartridges usually shoot better in general at the higher end. And then you get all that out of performance, right? For kicking the wind, et cetera. And, but then you got to shoot them against your chronograph. And that's just measuring shot to shot what the difference is. So if you can shoot really tight groups at a, at a thousand yards, um that has more to do with your wind call is good say if there is no wind that's your reloading practices so like because that group plus the deviation between shot to shot to shot of the muzzle velocity range the muzzle velocity spread so you can get like if you're into a, a, an ex a call it extreme spreads of over 10 feet per second like i have one gun it had a one foot extreme spread can you explain that? I don't know what that means, extreme spread. So that means when you shoot your rifle, every shot, that bullet is leaving at the same velocity. Okay. So, and that's really important because if you're trying to do a whole cal mathematical calculation, if, if say you're shooting at, it's say, we'll just use for easy numbers, 2,800. And then your next shot is 20, 28, 25. And then your next shot is 2,750. And then 2800 so that's not that's not acceptable because now you have a bullet leaving with the math that's supposed to be for 2800 that's now going slow oh, so you hit low yeah yeah and then you hit high and then you hit low and then you hit high right so then you, so you have that that math for that and then you have your group yeah so then your group size plus your velocity deviations so then what might look really good and I had this on one gun I set up where it would shoot the most crazy one hole groups, but the velocity, and you don't see that effect if you're shooting closer than 300 yards. And then, so you really got to push the distance to see that exaggerated effect in a long range set, uh, setup. So then what you do is you shoot your chronograph and then there's a bunch of fancy math. You can go on apply ballistics and it has a standard deviation math um, equation. And what that equation does is it takes into account your maximum group size combined with your extreme spread, your SD, essentially your standard deviation, shot to shot to shot. And it'll give you your theoretical group size at a thousand. So when you verse those, you're like, oh, the group that was not as small at a hundred. Well, actually, that's probably that is theoretically a more accurate low just because it's more stable and that's the thing if if your shot to shot to shot uh velocities are very stable that means it's going to be more resistant to temperature variation and changes in your shooting system so then that's the one that you'd probably want to go with oh okay. so so um backing up a little bit you said you you've gone through three barrels now does that do you does that have any impact on how accurate your gun is like, I mean, like your action eventually, it will get a little bit banged up, but essentially what they do is they'll do blueprinting. Some of the really good stuff like uh, defiance actions, um, you know, bad actions, um, surgeon, 
um, American uh, rifle company. The, like a lot of those are really, really high end actions and, and they'll, they'll take like 30 barrels. There, really there is no them. issue with that. Cause, cause if they, if there is some real pronounced issue, they'll just take the front of your action and then they'll cut it in square oh, Okay. on a CNC or lathe. Right. Um, it's not really that big of an issue, but yeah, like the barrel burnout, that's, that's a huge consideration though. Like, like I was saying, like with those 28 nozzles, like that is a hunting only rifle in my opinion. Like if you bang it out at the range, like if you're shooting lots of steel, that barrel's not going to last. Some of the really high, high performance stuff, like once you get through like the load workup, that's like 20% sometimes of your barrel life. So what happens to these barrels like that makes them like, do they twist? Do they heat? Do they bend? Like when they get that hot, what's happening to these barrels that makes them not as accurate or just basically unusable? Thermal erosion at the lands, usually, that's usually what it is. So the lands is right off the chamber when the bullet starts to hit rifling. That first part of the rifle is very critical. Um, it essentially turns up the bullet, spins up the bullet. You, you like you'll like a lot of guys will use jam and stuff like that. But essentially what that is is like when you're doing a load you work. Just, what, sorry, jam? Yeah, they'll jam them in. So like the target guys, they'll like seat the bullet so far out that it jams into rifling when it's chambered. Oh, okay. I thought you yeah. talking PJ and Jam. Yeah. <laughs> look at, look at, yeah. Didn't you have breakfast, man? You freaking yeah. so thinking about here. Food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, like, there's as that, as that, uh, as that, especially with Jam, like, like bullet Jam and stuff like that. I don't, I don't get into that because it's not practical for the field because you can't necessarily. Sometimes you, if you were to open up your bolt you could have the bolt stuck in there and that's just an absolute disaster if you're hunting <laughs> like yeah that okay this happened to me okay so like that 65300 was my dad's he gave it to me i took that on a goat hunt in like 2018 or something mm -hmm. and he makes his own bullets he makes yep. bullets for that gun uh which we'll get into in a sec um but i put the bullets like i i put them in the clip and then when you went to cycle them, they got jammed because they weren't coming up because they were too long. Yeah. So like I shot this goat and I went to chamber another bullet and yeah. it wouldn't go anywhere. I actually had to pull it out, quickly cut the, the they had the little these little blue plastic tips on them. I cut the end of that off and then it was able, I was able to get it up into there. But after I realized I could have just taken the bullet, opened the, like, opened the chamber, popped it in and closed it, but. Um, oh, the magazine length, it was too long? Yeah, it was too long for the magazine that, yeah. length, so it got yeah. jammed in there. Yeah. Now, does that have any, like, does all this come into play when you're shooting at these distances? Because I imagine it does. Like, your bullet, it's like an arrow. Like, an arrow, like, the the worst thing you can do in archery is have hand torque, in my opinion, right? Like, hand torque mm -hmm. is going to have the, when you're shooting at ranges above 50 yards, hand torque is going to influence your, what happens downrange, like, your, like, your, your arrows more than anything. Um, and then after that, it's just consistency, right? Like anchors, all that stuff. But like, how much of a, how much of a factor do these, like, does that say come into when you're shooting? Cause I shot that goat at 400, 402 yards. And luckily it died the first shot. It was a hard shot. No big deal. Pete, one bullet went down. It didn't need four. Um, <laughs> Get so wussy, cheap get shots, wussy, gotta get him in. Oh, <laughs> I, I get him into Pete all the time because he's always yeah. throwing at me. So I was on. It was funny. I'm gonna get off topic here real quick. Then we'll get back to bullets. So Pete, <laughs> I had to tell everybody on. Uh, I went on um, the cut right. Uh, no, the got game. Yep. Podcast last night, and uh, I had to tell everybody. I had to mention to the boys down there that you were uh, you're the new poster boy for. Um, Marks, oh, Marks. Did you see that, Derek? I oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The I, mannequin. I didn't even. I yeah. didn't even. No, it wasn't a mannequin. That was a poster. It was a poster. Oh, it was a poster, poster boy. That was in a. <laughs> yeah, and it's not even in. So I told my brother that he's and he said he's been going around to all the marks around in uh mid uh in central Alberta looking for looking for Pete. Well, my, I have I, to go I, down I the one here. Start recognizing a Pete paparazzi. Yeah, that's right. It, I, all I I'm swear saying to God, is they, I, they did a really good job of like photoshopping all those face. wrinkles because <laughs> you look like you're in your 20s in that poster. 
Oh, that's right. Photo editing at its best. I swear uh, to God, when I saw that, a friend of mine sent me that picture up from Nelson, I think is the store it was at. And I was like, if I find a store, especially our own that has that, I'm walking up with a jiffy marker and I'm going to sign that son of a bitch because it'll be yeah. the only time in my life I'll be able to say I did that. You should, that's, hey man, it's pretty cool that you're the new poster boy for Marks. And like the American listeners, Marks is like, I don't know what it would be compared to down in the U.S., um, but it's it's a fairly big store up here in Canada, and so Pete's the new poster boy for it. So it's pretty cool. But anyway, back to uh, bullets. So does that those bullets, the little things like that, does that have an impact of how you're shooting at those longer distances? Yeah, if you're trying to squeak out maximum performance, you could um, like in some of my rifles, I'll get them to with like a VLD reamer to ream it a little further into the bore, just so I have more more uh, more jump is what they call it. More, more space for me to seat bullets out further. So it's kind of like a diminishing return. Again, like it's just a balancing act. So the farther you see, if you're going to try and shoot like a really big bullet pretty quick, you probably want to seat out your bullets a little further because you think of it like, just like with like spining an arrow and something like that. <clears throat> um, when you fire a gun, it has a harmonic whip. So the, the bullet as it's leaving the bore, it'll cause a, so like the barrel is rigid, right? But when you use it under a high speed camera, it whips. So when you hit the top of that whip, there's a hesitation when it changes direction. So you want to time it for that whip. That's usually oh. when you, what you're trying to do. So, Jesus. so what you're doing is you, so it, essentially when you're doing a low workup, first, you just start like some, Fuck. like 15 thou from the lands. Or or the maximum distance you can seat your bullet in your in your uh, magazine, so that it it functions the firearm functions perfectly, and then I work up half grain increments, and I'll shoot six two two three packs. So it'll be like I'll work I'll work up into where I think okay this is like my acceptable velocity range that I want to be living in. Like the other stuff is just safety. I'll shoot 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 shoot, and obviously stick to your reloading guide. I'm not liable for anything here, but just, you know, <laughs> stay within safety. And as you're shooting up, you're looking at your pressure signs, your case, your, your primer, you're looking for anything that's showing on high pressuring, but as long as it's safe, you keep progressing and you get to that maximum range. And I use the, um, any, whatever bullet manufacturer, I'll use the bullet and the case manufacturer that I'm working with. Like I got burger bullets manual. And then, uh, the Hornady latest model too. you use those or nozzle or whatever you want to use. Um, and then once you get into that appropriate range, then you shoot, you shoot the groups. So three pack, three pack, three pack, three pack of your different grain increments. And then one of them will stand out as the winner. It'll shoot the best. And then you take that if it's lower or higher, if th sometimes there's two take those. And then what you do is you, you take your, like, say, I like to start 15,000 off the lands. So that'd be the maximum distance before we're talking about that jam effect occurs. You know that measurement. And I suggest everyone takes that measurement of their gun so they know the, the thermal erosion and thermal effect of your bore getting worn down over time. That will affect this tunability. Because um, as that distance increases, whatever, whatever you're reloading, that time, that distance will change. And that will throw your gun out of tune. Um, but essentially you take 15 thousands from the lands and I do the same powder load workup. And then I progressively push that bullet in. So I'll do six, six shots at 30 thousands, six shots at 60 thousands, six shots at 90 thousands from my original measurement. You just 15 thou or 30 thou, 30 thou, 30 thou, 30 yeah. thou. One of them will shoot lights out usually or be better than what that original 15 thou measurement sometimes the 15 thou and it shoots great gotcha but then you take those so 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 and you got to think of it like this so as you're in so as you're pushing that bullet further and further and further in there's case capacity now so that like it, it, as you're pushing it further and further in there's less available space so that intensifies the effect of the powder within it so you do have to check for powder overpressuring because essentially oh. what you're doing is you're making that case smaller internally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the then bullets the seated further. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so you're going to yeah, increase yeah. the pressure. So you may see a little bit of speed jump 
with the same powder. Um, but essentially what you're doing though is you're just tuning that harmonic effect. You're basically timing the bullet to leave the barrel at a certain time period. Mm -hmm. From combined. where the barrel is. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, and so that yeah, man. seeding that's... that bullet further and further in, that's a less effect than the effect of the amount of powder. So that's why you always start with the amount of powder, then your seeding depth secondarily, because that that you will not I you can find where some weird combination will just out of, out of the box work. But essentially that's what what you're adjusting. If if it doesn't shoot good just with the generic amount of powder that you're using at some random seeding depth, usually it's probably going to be really finicky, I found. Like obviously you know, there's some special circumstances, but always start with the powder, then do the seeding depth, and then you can further tune it from there. Like, I, I don't like guys to get too obsessed. If you can shoot a half minute group, um, like it's going to shoot probably as good as you can, realistically. Like I have one gun I did, just to prove a point, I did 15 days of cold bore. So that would be like, pull your gun right out of the safe, you shoot a group, just one shot, boom put it away. Boom. I did that for 15 days. I shot a group is from 0.52 inches at what distance? shots at a hundred yards. Gotcha. So, and like a lot of guys are obsessed about the long range stuff. Um, but like that same gun, I'll shoot a two inch group at 600 all day long. Man, and I've shot a 10 inch group at 1700 yards of that gun. So, so I gotta, I gotta ask this shots. about the long range when do you like after you've tuned and then super tuned as far as i'm can from what you're talking about your rifle and your cartridges when do you have to start taking into effect the coriolis effect uh around shooting? six seven seven hundred okay. what that are you doing throwing right? big words that like that out there what does that mean i well go ahead derek he's the pro so, <laughs> cor so coriolis effect <laughs> <laughs> is so you'll see cor cor Coriolis effect if not taken into account at a thousand yards will be a mess. Yeah, it will be a mess. Okay, what's the what's what is the what is that? What's the Coriolis spin of the planet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Spin of the planet uh, towards. So I should actually say so. Any if you're doing trajectory validation, it it should probably be done north to south. Gotcha. Right, because then you only have to deal with the spin spin effect of that. So when you're shooting east to west or vice versa, you're either going to be hitting high or hitting low. If you're if so, you're shooting towards the east, I'm pretty sure it's, that's what it is. The east, the plant's spinning towards you. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to hit high. Oh, yeah. By 10, sure. 10 inches. Oh, well, it depends on the caliber, but mm -hmm. that's what they say. It can be a 10 inch or, or then when you're shooting to the west, it's spinning away from you. So then it'll hit low. What about longitudinal? Does that have any effect? Because yeah. at some certain different places of the earth, the gravitational pull is different. Yeah. Yeah. So you, there actually is a value of that in applied ballistics where you put in your latitudinal, uh, wow. whatever you're on. And then, and then too, because that'll, that'll affect your spin drift too. Right. So that'll be an effect as well, as far as like gravity, all of that, like obviously the gravity fluctuates not too much. Um, but, uh, there are some places where it is intenser, but, but so, and then that spin drift is, is it's, it's there. Um, I don't think that, um, if you're rushed on a shot, I, I really don't think it's going to be playing as much of an issue as you think, mm -hmm. um, until you're really getting out into some long ranges, a thousand plus, you know, you're talking, you know, it could be a five inch effect, but that's the, that's the thing though, is like, okay, so it's half minutes or it's, it, it's it basically as those angles intensify, the farther you get out there. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's just what you're going to be dealing with, with, with shot equation and adjustments, but those you're not taking those shots like no. really quick or anything like that. You have to really have all this stuff really nailed down. Even if you're like for targets, like that's not impressive. Shooting, missing, and walking it in isn't as impressive as a first round or second round hit. Right. So, what about altitude? Yeah, big effect. So big that has effect. a bigger effect. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big effect. So say if you're shooting, um, say you're gonna go like say here it's it's so it's three thousand, I believe. 
here around Lethbridge, Alberta area. You're um, 3,000 feet 3, above. 3,000 feet, yeah. Level? yeah. Yeah. So if you're at sea level and then you go all the way up to, say, like 10,000, something like that, every 1,500 is a click reduction, they say. If in you're MOA. Gonna, in MOA, if you're going to game it. That's not exactly accurate, but it'll probably get you a hit on target. But uh, so, but again, it depends on the cartridge, like hyper efficient cartridges that, that a lot of those um, values that are just like, okay, you take a click out a click, you know, that's, um, that's definitely something you'd have to try out. And like with a 28 Nosler, like those super high performance cartridges, that's not going to be as much of an effect because everything is just so high performance. It's going to be going faster. It'll be less than that. Right. So mm -hmm. um, you'd have to take into account that as well, but um and and obviously know your numbers test your stuff that's why i say like a guy with 10 guns isn't going to shoot as good as a guy with one gun because he knows, he knows the ins and outs yeah. yeah yeah he's got stuff memorized he's got his range cards he knows you know his system's all going to work together um but yeah it does have a huge effect that's what you'd have to go and sight in because as the air gets thinner there's less drag right mm -hmm. so you have to yeah. have less that's i think that's like it's really interesting. I think we'll we should just do like a full episode on like um reloading and altitude and like practicing for that. Um Yeah, that's cool, man. There's so much that goes into it. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Oh yeah, you can go down the rabbit hole just like with archery. The the real thing that uh, I think determines whether or not someone's going to be a really good shot, I think is all on the reloading bench. Um Okay. That's that's where you really know your stuff. It's just like with tuning your bow or your arrow setups. As soon as you take ownership of your stuff and you start tinkering, you start figuring out the the minor changes, and um, and just like we were talking about tuning, you know, make you got to get into the habit of you make an adjustment. I like to write stuff down. I did this. Mm -hmm. I did this. I do one thing at a time, and I slowly creep towards the angle which is a perfectly tuned whether that's gun or setup or you know bow arrow setup whatever it is um but then once you get there especially with reloading you just shoot the damn gun <laughs> like yeah. yeah if you tinker there there's a thing it's, it's an entire section in one of the accuracy manuals that i read that's all about guys tinkering too much they tinker yeah. to the point where they're all, oh, I got to get it better, better, better. Well, that could be the maximum accuracy of that rifle. Yeah. You you may that, have that achieved happens it. a lot. I feel like that happens a lot in archery as well. Is where guys are like, they watch too many YouTube videos and they get too hung up on like arrows and, um, you know, and just everything and like paper tuning and all this stuff. And like, you need to shoot your bow more than yeah. anything. Like you can eliminate all that stuff, but if you're not, if you're not dialed in at, anchor po points where you're connecting yep. with the bow such as your grip and your release those are the two main parts like those have to be those have to be practiced and utilized so there's zero effect on that bow from you and then second of all you have to be able to do that consistently every single time you shoot your bow and the only way you're going to do that is through reps it doesn't matter how tuned your bow yeah. is yeah. you have to you have to be able to you have to be able to perform. You have to be able to do that consistently every time you shoot your bow. And that's the hardest thing. And like, I think a lot of guys, they just and get hung pressure. up on those little things. Under, under pressure. pressure too. Because <laughs> just like you say, it's not just reps in your basement, which is very important. But you put that deer, elk, moose, or if you're a comp competition guy, just the pressure of everybody watching, mm -hmm. you better be able to do it through that. Were there any it, shots at the Nationals last year, Pete, where you really felt the pressure? Um, like, were you, so you, how far, you placed second at the Nationals last yeah. year. I How far was the guy in the lead ahead of you going into, like, the last, like, was he ahead of you uh, or was he behind you? No, because like, I know it was me. close going into that last day. Yeah, it was, yeah, I should have been able to make it closer but it was my first day and it wasn't jitters or anything it's just getting into the motion of stuff um it, there was just a couple shots here and there like the competition so stiff that you know oh you, yeah man you, you fuck up on one mm -hmm. shot and it's like yeah now you're playing catch up yeah. so i was learning the format too going into another one you know it's all your three days are combined and then I was, the one thing I, I didn't know is that those combination scores keep getting added on in the finals 
So you have your shoot off and they changed the format a little bit in the shoot off um, for the outdoor 3D. I, I can't speak for anything else where throughout the whole competition, you know, you have your five points, your eight points, your, your 10, and then your, your X, like your, um, I guess if you want to call them 11s, I think is what they count them as. But going into the finals, if you get, it's called an inside out. Um, and that's when you hit that X, but you hit that X 10, I guess it's the 10 ring, but it's so perfect that you're dead. There's space in between the, the lines of that, of that circle and your arrow. And they call that an inside out. So instead of being worth 11, it's worth 14. And they do that in the final from what I understand to kind of give a chance for those close stacked up people to supersede them, to jump That's ahead. It. It's yeah, not, yeah. it's not like you didn't hit a beautiful 10 ring uh -huh. and a wicked shot, but they give a little bit of extra bonus to, you know, people who just did that little bit better. Well, when you, you get to up. that, when you get to that close between shooters, it's going to be that one specific shot that could make the difference of winning and coming in second. Right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, like those extra three points. is crucial. I think there was, I think there was, mathematically a chance where I could have taken first, but he would have basically have had to have his bow blow up and, you know, okay. not so shoot the, because he's okay. a good so shooter. The, he's not going to miss. It's, it's not a matter of, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're shooting. winning the, you're winning the Canadian nationals. I mean, you gotta be good. Yeah. Right. And, but I mean, no, mm -hmm. I mean, you play second. That's. that's yeah. No, it's good. good. So I, I would say no, no pressure. The only thing that was different in that format as well, that kind of messed up. I'm going to have to change my, um, my shot procedure going forward is they cut the time down. Like nobody's really timing you a whole lot when you're doing your, your actual rounds of shooting 3d, but in the finals it's timed. So theoretically you have a minute and a half to, per shot per shot, but, but in the think, finals, you, you think is a lot when you're thinking of a minute and a half to shoot, but then now you got to remember your glassing ranging. Yeah. And you want the arrow, to arrow, all that stuff. And you want to do everything the exact same every time, because if you get out of that, you're going to forget something. And then it's like, shit, did I turn my dial to the distance? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And everybody out there would be like, well, of course you did. But no, believe me, when you've done you this many shots, yeah. it's all repetition. So they actually cut the time down by 30 seconds. And there was two of my shots as one in particular it was my last shot. Um, and it fucked up my procedure because what I should have done is put my arrow in first. That's my new procedures. Put the arrow in, knock it. Don't worry about it. Then go to ranging, set your dial, then go to the binos, look at your target and then shoot. I was doing distance first, then putting an arrow in, then going with my binos looking, then shooting. And that all takes time. So it's a matter of cutting those times. If you already have your arrow knocked, you're saving yourself 20 seconds there per se. So I just felt rushed because my procedure got changed in the last freaking round, just out of the blue. You know, you do something all summer long and then you have to flip it in the last freaking five targets or whatever and kind of change it up. So it was more, I just felt a little rushed on a couple of them, but it's, I still did fine. It wasn't, I may have lost out on a couple, two points, maybe three points, but. Which still they add up, right? You start adding those mm -hmm. up over. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, um, I guess we'll wrap it up. I tell you, I got, I got a new chair down here. It's pretty badass. It's comfy as hell. I don't it looks nice. Normally, after an hour of sitting in this chair, the old chair, it's like, yeah, it's pretty rough. But.